Hey everyone, so I'm a little bit ill, but I've got a scheme. And that scheme is basically I'm going to put out some old work as a zine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to document the process so that if you ever want to make your own DIY punk rock self-published photo book, you'll have all the skills you need to do it, which is pretty cool. Um, because for a really long time, this kind of information has been, well, gatekept to hell. And the kind of people who had it wanted to basically take 20, 25 grand from you to make a photo book and in return give you a couple of hundred copies and the maths just doesn't work. So hopefully with what I'm doing and what I'm showing you, let's say you made a decent hardback book. You can do like I did. Hopefully you crowdfund it for like six, seven grand. You 200 maybe go for the pre-orders and you've got 300 to sell. You do that rough math. You sell it for 40 quid. That's about 12 grand. So there is a way to make money in photo books as a photographer. So yes. Um, take your power back, okay? So what I've written here is a little plan of how to, the steps you need to make a photo book. I'm going to end up putting that on my website. Uh, the zine I'm going to make is based on work I shot in 2013 at the Bilderberg um, kind of get-together in London, um, which was a hotbed for all kind of uh, the conspiracy theorists, which is funny because, like, back then, this was a very kind of fringe event, and that kind of mentality, wow, it meant, went mainstream, didn't it? So there's some pretty cool photos in there. Um, obviously, the first thing I did was had to kind of find the negatives, which was kind of hard because my negatives are just kind of thrown in boxes. It's a bit of a nightmare. But hey, when you're a skin photographer, you can't catalogue or pay for contact sheets. This is how it is. The good news is I only shot six rolls. So only six rolls of film. And on my Mamiya RZ67, that was 60 photos. So the edit is going to be relatively easy for me. Okay. So, okay, you're going to make a photo book, you want some inspiration. Now, I've never actually uh, published a zine before. That's, that's not actually true. Um, I've got a little exhibition catalogue that I made uh, for my infrared work that was showing at the Four Corners Gallery in East London. So, yeah, I have done something a little bit like a zine, but so far it's just been kind of big old hardback books. Now, for inspo, I've got Lucy Helton, this great book about fire uh, in a forest, and there's a little smudge of a thumbprint on the cover, which I thought was quite cool. Um, Rob Stoffard's uh, Tilbury which is uh, P-U-R bound. And the one thing with P-U-R you've got to watch out for is the gutter. If you try to do a double page spread, stuff could get lost. Obviously with Rob's work, what they did was they just put it, so yeah, it was, each photo was on one page. Uh, Cafe Roll Books, obviously no introduction needed. Uh, I'm planning to do a series of zines, so it's nice the way they've been consistent with the cover design and all these ones. In the same way, Another Place Press's uh, Field Note series, again, very consistent, um, sort of no text in it. And then the text at the back, so I've got Dan Wood and Claudia Leisinger's here, and again, doesn't that look nice? So I might have to be uh, inspired by that. <laughs> um, and finally, Overlaps, uh, publishing El Dorado by um, Melissa Aris. And again, some nice stuff in here, not, not to mention just the design and the layout, but little cool things like this. So again, I'll be looking at that for the way it's been kind of laid out. There we go. A big part struggle I had over the years, I mean, I didn't really self-publish my first hardback book until I was 41 years old, and that was this, In a Garden of England, and the next book's about to come out, uh, which is called When in the Lone Star State, and again, that was an archive of work made in Texas, but for a zine, I'm not going to print it offset, I'm going to print it digitally, because I'm not making that many copies, so this was printed by Mixam, it's when I was experimenting with a square format one, they used to do this for free, which is pretty cool, an A4 sheet. So um, again, just sort of looking at the quality there. I mean, it's a shame that sort of fold, you can see the gutter of the other photo. Um, so it's okay, I'm, I'm gonna try and probably pay for another one of those. And then obviously this is printed by XYZ and yeah, the quality was just, quality was amazing. So I've got a quote from them as well. And the quotes I've got right now, man, for like a hundred copies, uh, about 40 pages, they're floating anywhere between 250 and 360 quid which is pretty good, right? So yeah, there we go. Right, so look, um, I'm going to make a zine. And I said before I'd only made one, and I made kind of an exhibition catalogue that was kind of a perfect bound, PUR bound for an exhibition. But I was wrong, I totally forgot about my first book. This is totally out of print. Now I've got a couple of these left, which I just held on to. And it's a book about Occupy London that I crowdfunded and published back in 2012. So anyway, so let's have a little look. So yeah, let's start with PUR binding, okay? So we put the paper together, we wax and glue down it. It's quite a strong binding. Um, I know it was weird that I made a book with mostly horizontal photos, 
but I had so many photos to put in, I thought it was a cool way of doing it. Plus, you know, books with long spines like that, they're strong. You know, if it had been like that, it's not as strong because, you know, it's on a shorter edge. Um, yeah, I think it was so hard to remember now. Judging by the light, it was on silk paper, which I kind of like. And it had a slightly thicker cover. I can't remember the exact GSM, but it is slightly thicker. Again, for the uh, exhibition at Four Corners, it was on uncoated paper, which I've got to say, I've been researching. And for digital printing, it seems really good. And from what I've worked out, it's um, the photos I've seen printed digitally on, say, silk or glossy, the colours just go crazy. And for me, that's no good. They're far too vibrant, too saturated. And the colour on an uncoated paper printed digitally it just seems to absorb it. It just seems to, to look really nice. So I'm thinking about uncoated for the, the zine I'm making now. And again, Rob Stoffard's Tilbury, just looking again. It's a lot of text here. It feels like uncoated paper as well. And then PUR bound, quite a small size. I'm not sure if that's either all A5, maybe not quite. But yeah, my catalogue and Rob's book, they're the same size. There we go. Um, I won't pause this, just keep going. So, Cafe Royal Books, always a pretty similar layout. Uh, this one has text at the front, some of them don't, but you know, often it's not quite full bleed, but they're filling up a lot of the page, and then lots of double page spreads like this. Does this one have any text at the front? So, no, this one doesn't. Does this have any text in the back? No, it just doesn't. Just any text, just the photos. There we go. Um, we've looked at these briefly before, but let's look at Claudia Leisinger's book here from Field Notes. I said on a previous video that I thought the cover was on the same stock as the paper. No, I don't think so. It's really, it's very close. It might be only a few GSM more. Um, it looks to me like it's on silk paper. It's not glossy, which is again, a nice finish and very kind of simple layout here. And again, one thing I said before is very nice having kind of the text on the back and in a uniform way. So again, this is just a, with a staple across the binding here. Now, one thing to note with these kinds of zines is they say you shouldn't go more than 40 pages with that kind of binding. Um, all these ones here, like Rob Stoffard's Tilbury and my Occupy book, the reason we went for this kind of binding was because there are so many more pages. So there you go. Um, last by no means least, El Dorado by Overlaps um, by Melissa Aris. I just got to say, um, Tiffany Jones of Overlaps, I just love her design. She's a great designer. Um, so let's just count, like they say when you design, there's a certain amount of spreads, right? Different kind of spread layouts in a book to kind of make it work. So let's count, shall we? So one, full bleed horizontal. Two, two, sorry, horizontal, I meant vertical. Sorry, guys, I'm ill. Anyway, sorry, one full bleed vertical. Two little verticals here with white border. Two horizontals with a blank page. Again, so we've had this kind of layout before already. Um, slightly fuller here, smaller. So it does jump around a bit, but notice how there's lots of negative space, you know, you let the photos breathe. I think if you are going to have a photo on every page, it is nice to have this kind of larger white border. Um, but yeah, it just works, doesn't it? So I think, yeah, I'll be looking more into that, that kind of design. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know how to do this now because my phone's up here. I'm just going to talk to the camera. Um, there's other ways of uh, looking up zines. Um, you can maybe go and check them out in shops, um, like the photographer's gallery. Uh, you can look at online. The other thing is, man, these are really reasonable to buy. Like the field notes, I think they're eight pounds each. Cafe Royal books are very reasonable as well. Just, you know, support a photographer, buy a couple of zines and uh, yeah, get, get inspired. So one thing that I forgot to mention with uh, the zines I was showing earlier, which was, yeah, so you can have it, you know, perfect bound, PUR bound, or you could have it uh, stapled. But you look, a lot of people do really cool kind of folds here I forget the, the name for it but look at this book so this is Nico Baumgarten's book Berlusconians and no Berlusconians and basically the point was is that on one side is all the fans of Berlusconi and on the other side is all the people who aren't fans of Berlusconi so these are the people who aren't into Berlusconi he was then the kind of was it Italian was it Italian I want to say Italian do they have a president a prime minister Italian president anyway terrible terrible but Anyway, so there you go. So it's interesting. It's like a flip book and it's got this interesting sort of binding. Okay. And then we've got Traces Within, Eva Valsaki. I'm so sorry if I murdered your name there. I'm so sorry. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the point is, is that, again, lots of very interesting folds here. And it's sort of very, sort of many, many different ways of kind of putting this book together. So again, you can kind of think about different ways of kind of folding. And I think the benefit of self-publishing as well is 
some publishers, if you came to them with a really wacky idea like this, they'd be like, no way, they're going to get destroyed in a shop, or it's really impractical to produce. If you're making it yourself, you can do whatever you want. So there you go. So I realised I was talking about zines, because obviously I'm making a zine, but some of you will be making a book. So I thought I'd just uh, give a nice kind of overview here to make it really simplified. There's only two types of book, photo book. There's the big coffee table book with the kind of very sort of simple, simple design, often, you know, photo page here. I think Robert Frank's The Americans. And the flip side, you have like your freaky deaky, more independent, wacky book design with, you know, different paper stocks and, you know, acetate sheets and all, all kinds of stuff. So that was my book, The Unseen. But, you know, it's very much a trend in um, photography. So, you know, lots of photographers, especially, you know, publishers like Overlaps, so sort of making these very interesting, very kind of, uh, I'd say much more kind of potentially niche books, but actually it's kind of much more mainstream now to sort of do photo books like this. And, you know, it's quite interesting. It's more, almost like, more like a novel, you know, a different way of looking at it. Um, obviously, you know, some work works really well in a more simple way. So here we go, Edmund Clark, Still Life Killing Time. And does the book need to be overly designed? Well, no, it doesn't. You know, you can let the photographs kind of speak for themselves. And that's kind of, you know, a leaf I took out. I mean, here, Alex Off Songbook. So again, more traditional coffee table book. Um, photo a page here. Are there any any doubles or? No, pretty much just uh, just photos there. Oh, bit of a fold there. And obviously my last book, In the Garden of England, again, I just went the coffee table route. So I chose mostly to have just, you know, single photo. But now and again, there'll be little, uh, little diptychs here. So again, when you're making your your photo book, have a think. How do you want it to be? Do you want it to be a more traditional coffee table book? Or do you want to make it a more kind of quirkier, independent book? And the thing is, they do overlap as well. So here's Pinkas off his site walk, which, you know, from this face off, it looks like a pretty traditional coffee table book. But then look at that kind of binding here, just open binding. And there's sort of uh, see-through sheets in it, leading through to text. And even the way the paper's folded over. But then, on the flip side, Lewis Bush's uh, Metropole, a similar kind of binding. And although this is much more, kind of more independent kind of photo book design and style, um, they have that in common. So, you know, they do, they do overlap in style. But yeah, I think it's a good decision to make. What do you need? What does your work need? Does your work need the simplicity of the coffee table book? Because the photos speak for themselves enough. Or do you want to try and create like a richer kind of narrative? Because maybe that speaks more to the nature of the work. These are all decisions you want to make at every step of the way of designing a photo book or a zine. Ah, uh, so here we go. Negative there in the flex tight scanner. And I've just done a little preview. And here we go, it comes through. Now, it's not quite right. I'm using a grey point on David Icke's little grey hair here. I'm trying to sort the colour out. It was a sunny day. So... Looks a bit magenta on the phone, but trust me, on the screen it looks good. And then in the old days, I'd export it as a 3FF file. But something's happened in the past year where, because of lots of computers going to 64-bit, it won't run this old FlexColor software, which is a bit of a nightmare. So what I'll do is I'll save it as an FFF file, just out of habit, but I will export as a high-res TIFF. But make sure that TIFF, the colour balance, is pretty good. And then off we go. Scan, scan, scan. Okay, so I've got my scans, and uh, now I'm going to make a little contact sheet, but I'm going to use um, Photoshop, so I'm going to go File, Automate, Contact Sheet 2, drag this over, it's on my second screen. Now I just choose the folder where the photos are in, um, where are we at, there we go. That will do. These are pretty high-res TIFFs. Now, I'm picking two rows and two columns. That's the size for the output. And I just click OK, and off we go. It's a little automated process. Let's make a load of little sheets of paper. I think A4 with uh, two rows, two columns, which means four photos per page. Just going to chunter away. They're quite high-resolution TIFF files, so it will take a little while. Right, so there we go. Starting to put them together really slowly. I'm eating a banana while I wait for it. Okay, so now I have 
33 small prints and that was from a wider edit of 80 photographs so I'm just going to trim them down now and we'll have a little play right you're going to have to imagine me guillotining them because I couldn't quite manage to do that with uh, two hands but here we go so now I've got um, lots of small photos I can start laying them out and sequencing them so I'm just going to have a little play I'm back in a minute so I've had a little arrange now um, trying to sort of cluster them so I've got these kind of uh, security guys hanging out as a set. I've got the stay on the barrier sign in three of the photos. So I'm maybe thinking about one of those. And then obviously cars arriving. But it's kind of more reportage moments, even shoot them shooting a very large medium format camera. I kind of still like picking off these little, little observed moments. So I've got a few of these. Um, some of them sort of more middle distance. I've got some of the key players. So there's one of David Icke, the one I liked of him, and then two of Alex Jones, one of him in the crowd, and a portrait. And speaking of portraits, I've got a nice sort of set of portraits here as well. And then my detail shots, a bag, tinfoil hat, and this really cool shot I love of the guy holding the bag bad jita, but he's like in a suit. It's pretty cool. And then some shots of the podium. So that's uh, my paint for my canvas, and that's what I'm going to try and used to put my uh, sequence together. So, you know, I, I don't think I want to start with straight with lots of people, or even the word Bilderberg or the podium. In my head, I think I might keep these key players to almost be like in a vortex in the middle. I've got a few nice detail shots here. Maybe, you know, maybe I start with the bag first, because it's just a bag and it says this little sign. It's sort of, you know, you're arriving there. Or maybe I've got a car coming in where I've got this, you know, very strange sign saying, stay behind barrier. And that's kind of very surreal. I mean, this one kind of gives away what's going on a bit. But, you know, part of editing a photo book or a zine is, you know, maybe you don't want to give it all away in the beginning. You want your viewer to kind of slowly get immersed in it. So, yeah, I think that's how I'm going to play it. Uh, the portraits, you know, I could have them as a set of portraits together in a book. I could have them peppered throughout. I think what I might do is I might drop them throughout and try and find some sort of overlap between maybe people in the photo and the photo before or after to see there's some kind of relevance there in the series. Um, I mean, this bag, it does say, hello, I'm an Earthian on a peace, on a peace pilgrimage. And then there's this guy talking and if you look closely, he's got some kind of weird pixie ears. So who knows, maybe he's like a, an alien from another dimension come to say wacky stuff I don't know you know I just I just have fun kind of putting uh putting these like funny things together you know so yeah we'll see what happens I mean I do have these shots saying you know stay behind the barrier and then this funny shot here it's this very young girl and a guy but then another guy's on the other side of the barrier so you know playing with that um I've got these weird overlaps where it's like the Bilderberg guy and a policeman and they're kind of side by side it's almost like yeah they're on the same team and although I do have like the very stern shot of one of the security guys, look, I've got him smiling here with the other guy. It's quite, quite amusing. So I can try to think about kind of the tone of what's happening in the photos. And, you know, there's only a few, because I shot so little, I only shot 60 pictures, six rolls of film, where I've got two choices, you know. So what is it? Is it the guy in the tinfoil hat and the kind of, you know, just sat? Or is this funny one of him in the tinfoil hat with like a strange clap? I kind of like the way he's clapping. It is like a weird, almost like a weird hand gesture. It looks kind of cool. In the same, I've got two choices here for kind of the wider shot. You know, is it that one or that one? I do like the fact in the foreground here, we've got like, they're picking up a kid. There's something going on there. Maybe there's something happening with that. I mean, to be fair, I'm saying all this kind of stuff like, oh, look, this could be this, this could be that. Until I start just throwing photos around, I don't know. And that's part of a fun part of why you want to print these photos out. So maybe you can just go for it, just make some weird associations. So I'm going to stop filming for a bit and just have a little play and see what happens. So what I've done now is try to group them. And uh, this is kind of my kind of more positive peace vibes. I've got the peace flag and the hello, I'm an earthling sign. I've got the guy talking with the kind of aliens or elf ears. I've got this almost kind of quasi-futuristic, weird geometric shape. I've got this dude reading the Bhagavad Gita, this woman all in white, like she's meditative, and this nice woman here, little floral and red and glowing, so it all seems quite positive and peaceful. I've got my little conspiracy theory corner here, the guy with the 9-11 t-shirt and, I guess, World War Three Zionism, I'm not sure there, and tinfoil hat dude. I've got this little barrier thing I said about where... 
there's like, you know, don't step past the barrier, but then these two past the barrier. I've got a strange thing here where it's like there's two guys having a chat and then there's like the Bilderberg guy and the police, but maybe they're, you know, they're in cahoots. And hey, look, even one of the protesters has like a police bandana. So that wild stuff. And look, I've got Alex Jones. There's his face. But there's his face on the T-shirt. The guy saying Bilderberg find a general, which is a play on the witch find a general thing. So I've got, you know, I've got some little little mini narratives going on. So maybe there's a way that I can kind of weave these together to create a little a little thing. And I know that's just all just kind of based in my head and what's in the photos, but this is this is generally how I like to to edit my work, you know? I'm a documentary photographer, but I just like the visuals to kind of create their own narratives too. And who knows, man, maybe people will look at them and they won't even see what I'm seeing, but that's fine too, you know? So there we go. Okay, so that literally took me five minutes, but I think I got it. So I'm going to crop that shot here into a vertical. Now I normally never do that because I shoot square, but I'm going to crop that into a vertical. That'll be on one side. This is then like my double page spread of like what's going on here. These people sit in the field. Then we're like, oh, don't cross the barrier. Then there's people over the barrier. And then you see there's more people, what they're doing. She's there. Then we've got a little first diptych of the bag. I'm an earthling and peace. And then this guy here. Then because it's like the earthling and alien, whatever, there's weird geometric shapes, which then leads on to the whole bag Vegeta thing, and he's being filmed. Now, there's loads of people filming him, which comes to the cameraman, which then comes to this shot with a sign and the cameraman's kind of filming. Um, the police guy of the tape, because then there's this interplay of the guy of the thing and whatever. But then we're into kind of conspiracy territory, so 9-11 t-shirt, tinfoil hat dude. And then the signage here. Now, I'm not so sold on either of these pictures unless I do something wacky and really crop in his face to mirror the crop of the shirt. And then there's Alex Jones walking in and finishing with David Icke, so that's my finish. I've got a number of outs that I kind of like, um, so I'm not quite sold on it yet. But that's, that's a rough beginning. And what I'll do now is I'll number them, all the photos. Uh, so when I put them in a pile, I'll kind of know what order I kind of got to. And I'll keep working that over the next few days. Okay, so yeah, so for laying out my photo books in the past and, and now, um, it's pretty industry standard to use Adobe InDesign. So that's what we're looking at here. I've already made a new document, but let's say we're going to do it again. We'll go File, New Document. We drag that screen over. Um, you can do a custom size. So let's do it by mil. At the moment, I've choose to make a zine. It's 190 mil by 230. I've got 40 pages. Um, when you're making a hardback photo book, you make your cover separately. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, it's been ages since I printed the zine, I'm not sure if you have to do that with the way I'm doing it as it's a staple binding. It might be different obviously if you have to do a PUR bound or perfect bound book because you'll have a spine. Um, for gutter, I've done three mil, but this is very important here, three mil bleed. And again, that seems pretty standard, so you want to make sure when you export your PDF to send to the printers, you've got a female bleed and that means it's going to trim okay. Anyway, that's what I've done. So here we go. So what I'm doing here is I've made just a sort of a bit of an experiment with different kinds of layout. So here's my first layout where it's a vertical photograph and it's not full bleed, there's still a white border. And next up, we have a horizontal photograph that is kind of full bleed across the edge, sort of sort of kind of maximum size there. Another spread now is where there's two slightly smaller verticals, but they'll be side by side, and two horizontals side by side. Oh, look, that's a little bit off. So look, while I'm doing this now, look, you see I put a little guide there. So to drag a guide down, you just stick at the top, drag it down, and boof, it's there. And over here, this is quite fun. So it says here, a parent, look, I'm just going to be honest with you guys, right? No one's ever taught me any of the things I'm showing you. It's just stuff that I've worked out. If I'm using the wrong terms, sue me. Um, this is for free. And yeah, anyway. But um, so on this one, let's say if you were setting up a ruler or a grid. So where is it? Again, been a little while. Here we go. Create guides. So let's say I wanted to create some rows and columns here. I don't know. I'll just pick an arbitrary number. There we go. Maybe make those a bit smaller. And I'll click OK. Boom. Look at that. I've got loads of grids we can snap stuff to and move stuff to. And because I've done it on this page, on this A parent page, it's going to come across all the other pages. You see? So you can use those to kind of keep your 
composition, not composition, and use your design and layout consistently. If you want to turn them off and on, you just have to press W on your keyboard. Okay. So this can be handy for when you're laying out captions or you're trying to work around other stuff. Now, a guy taught me something years ago and I've forgotten it, but I think there's a much better way of laying out these rulers so it fits the actual size better. You see these aren't really overlapping with that, that edge here, that pink kind of purple edge. But anyway, there you go. So that's it. That's it in a GIF. So anyway, moving forward still to um, spreads like that for a double page spread. And then this one's nice, isn't it? A nice full bleed one. Now, one thing you've got to watch out for these ones is where the gutter is because you you know often you will lose something you can lose some of your image in the gutter and i made the decision not to put this image like this because the gutter is going straight through this guy here and this guy here and actually the middle of that thing so again a simple design thing i'm going to make the conscious decision to pop it there and have the gutter going in that little negative space there then a full bleed vertical and that's it i think that's what i'm going to play around with to begin with okay um, the astute might have noticed that I haven't even photoshopped the photographs yet at all from the scans. So there's still lots of dust and stuff on them. And the reason I would have done that is, is that until I've got my final edit, look, man, I'm not going to spend ages on Photoshop getting rid of dust and scratches and taking forever. I will just do the ones that I need. OK, so I know that was a quick, quick blitz through there. But um, on the on the bulk of it, that's that's where we're getting into the idea now that you've maybe got your little pile of photographs that you sequence and you can start dropping them in and that's what I'm going to do um, so I might not show you this because it's a bit tedious but I'll basically drag in dropping photos in as they go and then kind of taking it from there other things to think about that I've probably forgotten um, we'll cover that in Photoshop but you'll need to convert your photographs to CMYK um, I'll cover exporting later on so exporting it here um, we'll cover like putting in text another time as well. But for now, it's just a matter of kind of getting your photographs in into some sort of semblance of an order that you're happy with. And then maybe just printing off the first little copy of your zine just so you can flick through it and sort of see how the photos work actually in the context of a book rather than on a screen. OK, so there you go. In my hand, I've got my little pile of photos from my edit and it's about I'm just putting that on my other screen. It's about 21 photographs. And all of the photographs I've kept the same aspect ratios. If they're horizontal, they're horizontal, vertical, vertical, but not this shot. This shot, what I'm going to do is, look, I've, I've got it in here. I can pinch this and drag it over. There we go. And you get the idea. If I press, there we go. And then once that's here, I can have a little mover away. No, not like that. Get that back there. Wrong clicker. So if I click on this one over here, now I click on that, I should be able to, that's it. I can keep that crop and now I can move that image around. So if we get it at on the edge of a sign, is that a bit distracting? Hmm, tricky decisions. Anyway, for now, I just, in my head originally, I just thought I was just the car, but now I'm thinking maybe the guy looking over is good. But anyway, there we go. So, shot one here. Now, the pages uh, layout thing is very handy. It's a very nice way of skipping around your document. And I've saved all my little layout um, ideas, like my little, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? <sighs> Or templates, I guess. So yeah, my rough way I'm going to spread it out. So that was that first shot I've done a kind of full bleed all the way to the edge. Now the second shot is one of the signs. It says stay behind barrier. That's the right one. There we go. So I'm going to drag this over. And in my head, where a lot of stuff happens, I just thought about doing that one kind of full bleed across. So I'm going to hold shift and just drag it down. Um, keep making it smaller and smaller until it sort of you can see the edges of it. That's it. And then I'm going to line it up here. I'm going to keep drawing this back until it fits for the full bleed. And I'm going to hold Shift, Command, and Alt. Now auto fill. Now I did say earlier, you know what? I haven't edited these photos at all. I haven't even yet yeah, cropped them or done anything. But just for now, just imagine that. Now remember in the previous video I said about where the gutter was in the double page spread. So let's have a play. Is it good like that? Or like that? I think this is better, isn't it? Because look, that line is going here. And then again, look, there's a cluster of people just here. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Let's have a little look. Maybe that will be OK. Maybe that's nice. The car in the end here. What I can do is um, if I just click on this, 
and drag that in. I'll just crop that out. That looks a little bit easy to, easier on the eye, doesn't it? A bit easier on the eye there. So as you can imagine, it's going to take me a little while. Um, but you know what? I really, I really enjoy doing this. I don't get much um, free time. So when I do get to do something like this, I put some music on or I listen to a podcast. Or you know what? I tell you what, um, last time I was doing something like this, I put on Beverly Hills Cop. That's right. I had Beverly Hills Cop on my second screen and I was editing away and it was amazing. So yeah, um, if you're not writing or anything like that, it's quite nice. You can, you can have stuff like that. And I just find it really, really relaxing, really enjoying. It's really, it feels really productive and you're putting something together. So yeah, um, this is where I'm going to be at for a couple of days now. So hopefully if you're doing this along with me as well, there you go, man. You've got a couple of days to get this done. Okay. Yeah, so a few fun things of InDesign. So look, um, I want to put this photo in the middle. And you see if I, I drag it around and I get to the middle of that page, there's a pink line cutting through it there. But if I want it right in the middle, I drag it down and bang. Once I've got that, that slap bang in the middle. Okay, it's pretty cool. Now, the reason I'm doing that is I, I just showed you I had that at the first shot and I had this as a double page, like full bleed. And I'm thinking... You know, I'm just going to end up doing this throughout the book. I need to be a bit more sort of why am I doing it? So I like the fact this does say stay behind barrier and this shot. I do have them kind of breaking that breaking that line. So maybe what I need to do is maybe this needs to actually be up here. So another thing you can do. So look, this this photo on the left hand page of stay behind barrier. If I get this at the top, it's going to tell me when it's lined up. There you go. You see, it's told me it's lined up. But as we know, also, they're not quite the same size. So I'll pull the grid up. I mean, it doesn't help that I've got these wacky borders on because I haven't photoshopped them properly yet, but you get the idea. Look, just imagine, okay? So those two stand side by side and, you know, do we look left to right? Do we go stay behind barrier? And then that shot where they're like, oh no, we're not staying behind the barrier. <laughs> or do I do it more like, hey, where is this? I won't be pedantic. Let's just, let's just get in there. Let's do it. Here we go. Or do you want it more like, um, Hey, we're just hanging out in a park and it's a lovely day and blah blah blah. No, this is it a fair and no, stay behind barrier. I don't know. Things to think about. Um this shot I liked where, you know, it's Hello I'm an Earthian on a peace pilgrimage from London to Vidur, and there's this guy talking, you can't see much about him, but you can see he's got kind of like he's got kind of like pixie ears. And one thing to point out actually when we're editing in InDesign is is that this looks actually quite good. But sometimes it might look a bit low res. So under view, you have a button called overprint view, and that makes it like super high quality. There you go. So even the color cast changed. Wow, that was cool. So yeah, you turn that off and stuff doesn't look so good. And it's a bit more blocky sometimes. You turn it on, you're getting more of kind of a how it's going to look. But yeah, so there we go. So yeah, I'm holding uh, command minus to zoom out, command plus to zoom in. And I think it's, let me get this right. Ooh, I do it automatically. I don't think anymore. Shift command O. Or shift command zero no oh there we go all command and zero and it just centers whatever's um in the way in the screen to like fill the page up i think i've messed up i've actually done a shortcut i'm opening bridge <laughs> oh i think i closed i'm talking to myself now
So this is the layout as it stands, and I'm not happy with it yet, obviously. So you do this quite a lot when you're making a photo book or a zine, where you're going to kind of just get some stuff down, and stuff's going to change. Now, I've zoomed out quite a lot on InDesign. I did that by holding Command and Minus, and that's so I can just sort of scroll through and get a bit of a kind of an overview. Now, at a certain point, I will print this zine out just as a little dummy, just to actually flip through it, but... I find just even viewing it in this kind of mode, zoomed out in InDesign, is, start, is, is quite good because you kind of start to feel the flow. And immediately I get to this area, this bit here, these two photos, this one and this one, it's starting to feel quite good. But then it kind of, kind of not so good again. I don't know. It's, it's hard to express, you know, like it's funny things, isn't it? Like obviously you can pick it apart why some of it feels better than others or it works better even the compositions are better or blah 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 but for me anyway a lot of this process is quite intuitive now one thing i mentioned was about kind of the different types of layout when you're designing a photo book or zine and at present look i've got one here which is kind of like a full full bleed vertical then these two horizontal like landscape shots with you know a bit of board around each side then the similar kind of you know, landscape composition here, but then with a border and then a full bleed portrait. And now when I get to these formal portraits, every kind of more formal portrait throughout the zine, I've done it with a border, you see? So all these portraits here, they're like that, apart from this one. There's a few like that one, that one, and that one I've gone for like a full bleed. Um, I'm really not happy with the, this opening shot. I'm gonna have to kind of think about that. I think I'm leaning maybe to having just a weird stay behind barrier shot. Um, but yeah, at the moment, the design's very basic. And the thing is, right, is, yeah, you know, you could be a designer thousands to design your photo book for you. And a lot of people, they have that luxury. They can afford to do that. I just can't. Um, and the thing is, with a, a good photo book, you know, sometimes with really good photos, you don't need to have that kind of over design. Like it can be it can be how it is. And. I think with enough looking at it, enough patience, enough eyes on it, and enough honesty, eventually you can lay out something that does does look good. You just got to persevere. So look, um, I need help. I think I'm gonna reach out to a few people. I'll export this as a low res PDF, and I'm just gonna do that now. So I'm gonna go up to File, Adobe PDF Presents. Now there's a smallest file size, which I guess you could click, but that makes it so low res it's no good but we can adapt it, we can change anything. So let's just click smallest file size for now. Uh, Bilderberg low res zine. So I'm just typing the name, I'm gonna save it. Now under here, this is all fine, all the range yet, but I'm gonna to go to compression. Now at the moment, look, bicubic down, down sampling, 100 pixels or inch to 150. Well, let's make that up to 200, bring that quality up. And for automatic JPEG, yeah, but let's make it medium. And the grayscale images, well, there aren't any, but let's just do that. I just, you know, I just do that by um, by default. I just do that for whatever reason. Anyway, marks and bleeds. We could put a bleed on it. We don't really have to right now because we're not sending it to print. Color destination. This is interesting. Um, at the moment, I haven't bothered about converting the files or whatever. But anyway, we don't care. Let's just, let's just export it for now. While it's exporting, if I click up here, you can see the timer. It's not going to take too long. And what I'll do is I'll send that PDF to some friends and they will view it. And once it's uh, open here, I will drag it into view. Where is it? Where is it? Bilderberg. There we go. Here we go. So what I'm going to do I'll zoom out and I'm going to go view page display to page view. And now if I just scroll through it, you see, there we go. So now it's my zine. And I'll send this to a few people and just see what they think. Um, as I said, I haven't photoshopped the photos yet at all. Um, with these kind of, you know, reasonably high res scans of medium format negatives, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of dust and scratches and the color cast are always wacky because obviously you're shooting on film. A daylight balanced film and you know it's never the perfect condition so the colors are all going to be over the place so anyway that's where i'm at right now so i'll be going through this and trying to have a tweak 
but yeah I'm, I'm not at all happy yet but it's a process okay and all that matters is how it is when you send it to print all of this it just doesn't matter keep playing keep moving stuff around you will get there okay okay so <clears throat> i had a little play since just literally immediately after the last video and made some changes and i'm feeling a lot better about it so this shot where i thought well it gives a lot away in one photo because you know i've got the barrier on its own and the people well maybe it's good that it's all together you know I've always liked using elements in a composition together. I just find it more interesting. You know, an amateur might have just photographed just literally just a close up of the sign, you know? But then look, it's a sign. It's the two police here. It's the police and the, the horizon and the car. It's these two dudes who look straight out of the frickin' 60s, right? Uh, with a weird sign saying stay behind barrier, but then in red, but then everything is okay in blue. And this chap, or maybe, you know, who knows, that's like us, that's the viewer, who kind of in the photo looking on, you know. <clears throat> Turn this one into one photo on its own, because I thought it was worthy of it. Uh, again, I had her with like a photo on the side, and you know, classic mistake with uh, young photographers, if they're doing a zine or a photo book, is literally just jam it full of photos. And sometimes, you know, photos need a bit of space. It's good to have... You know one focus you know just let the viewer just say hey look this is important and it's important on its own but when you are doing you know two photos together across a double page spread you know think of it i think of it anyway like a diptych you know so here's this guy and he's got his like his alien ears you know his elf ears and he's talking and then here's this bag and it says i'm an earthian on a peace pilgrimage from london there you go so I feel in a way for me that's that's connected. This photo is a banger, so that's on its own. That's cool. Again, happy with that. I changed this uh, wide shot before. It was a couple picking up a kid in the background, but you know, still got this guy kind of looking up at the sky. Like, what's he looking at? And I think I know what he's looking at because, um, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you. It happens a lot in my photos. You'll have to work out what they're looking at. But I know what they're looking at. Okay. <laughs> all right um we've got this guy with the camera and this here and i still think this works you know cameraman and the cameraman and there's some signs which then leads on to the next lot of signs and then this is a new addition um i had this security guard in his own looking moody and it was a bit boring was again this is just weird you know the guy's got a shirt pulled over his head and the security guys for like the bilderberg event and they're smiling you know they're just there it's nice uh bilderberg find a general but alex jones's face and then it's like, where's Wally? Well, there's Wally. There's Alex Jones. And then bang, there's Alex Jones. And, you know, he's larger than life. So fill up a page, his face. And then boom, there's David Icke. And then I thought then I shot the two guys having a chat, you know. So there we go. And then from two guys having a chat to two guys having a chat. But then like, oh, he's police, he's Bilderberg, what's going on, you know. And then again, here's the protester at Bilderberg, but he's got the police line as a bandana. Um, the back of this guy of the 9-11 inside job, 7-7 inside job um, thing. But then, boom, there's the front of him. Um, and then the tinfoil hat guy, and that's it. I think, I think I'm very close. Um, I might have to go back through my out pile and just see if there's something I missed. But for now, I feel like we're nearly there. We're nearly there. There we go. Right, so thinking about now the cover. Um... So yeah, I was thinking this image, um, I might change the image, but for now, let's talk about text. I was going to do a salt and pepper, let's talk about text thing, I just, I just can't do it. But you know, imagine, imagine I had just done that. Um, so yeah, at the moment, um, fonts and things. So um, yeah, at the moment, this one is Dunkel Sans version 0 0.7 condensed, and I kind of like the way you know, um, you can basically, once you've got something highlight, you can fill it like that. Or what I was doing was just having it see through, but that was kind of cool. But then we need to talk about fonts, the fonts. So let's whip that one out of the way for now. Let's whip this guy in. So I found this one on Adobe fonts, which I'll show you in a minute. And yeah, Adobe fonts is pretty cool. You just go there, you click activate on any fonts you pick and boom, it's suddenly working across your Adobe Creative Suite. So it's working in InDesign and Photoshop. It's pretty spectacular. So yeah, there's that font or where's the other one hidden? 
hidden it somewhere. This is fun, there it is. Or this one. So I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I'm going to have to ask some people. I'm kind of going off that one now. Kind of like that one because it's so swirly. But you know what? Maybe bottom line it is it's just the first one. You know? I don't know. But anyway, fonts. Yes. So let me just fire this up. So I'm going to go to Adobe Fonts. Um, it's free if you have an Adobe subscription. And yeah, here we go, man. Here we go. So I can just pick... Hey, this one looks pretty cool. So I'm going to click on this font. Um, and I've got activate fonts here. Gist, gist up right. I've activated the fonts. And now hopefully, if I close that down, and you guys will get the gist. <laughs> hey, let's have a look. Um, G, gist, there you go. Gist, oh dear, that's quite, that's quite something, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know if I want that now. <laughs> Uh, regular, regular gist. It's a big font. It's too big. It's not fitting. I'm gonna reduce the font size. I'm just gonna type eighty there. It's probably still too big. I love it. I love all this. <laughs> there we go. Um, let's try sixty for now. Uh, so this, this is going so well. That's what it's like all the time. There we go. We're missing any the the bug. Again, just playing around. I don't know. I don't think I like that. But yeah, that's the point. You can just literally open Adobe fonts and yeah, just drop drop in a font and uh, see if you like it or not. Um, so yeah, so I'll be doing a little play around with this for quite a while. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking what what fonts going to work. Obviously, it's sometimes good to think about, yeah, you know, what's your book about? What's the photo book about? And maybe there's a font that aligns with that. Also, be careful your fonts. Some fonts come loaded with meaning. So they might all be attributed to something else that you're not aware of, like the Wild West or, you know, the 1920s or whatever. And if that doesn't really fit, then, yeah, that's not so good. So, yeah, do do keep that in mind. Um, yeah, which one? I was kind of, what was this on? 80? That was more than that. It was 110. So, yeah, while we're on the subject of font size, font size is really important. And it's more important when you're talking about the text in your book. Um, yeah, so to do text, I'm just going to click on the T here. I make a like a column for, and if you want to see it, you press W. You can see what's going on here. Bit of a mess, isn't it? That's because I got those um those grids on still. So grids and guys, hi guys. There we go. So yeah, so that's what I'm working with to write text in. I saw someone clever, and again, there's more. There's more stuff on YouTube of people just doing sort of basic InDesign, whatever. Um, but yeah, um, fill a placeholder text. There we go. So the common error again with lots of students or people making their first books or whatever um, is making the font too big. So even at the moment, this is Minion Pro, and at twelve, I just think that's going to be too big. Like I can hold up a zine of this size and I'll be able to see, man, it's huge. So let's just try nine. Let's try nine. I think it's a bit too small. I think in my last book, I was around, yeah, it might have been around nine, might have been 9.5, but trust me, uh, uh, if this is 190 mil by 230 mil, that's gonna be big enough. So let's say you've got loads of text you're pasting in your essay. Um, up here in the top left, it will show you the size of your text block. So at the moment, let's just do it by number. So let's make it 75 mil wide. It's done that. And let's just place it right in the middle. And we know from earlier, once you place it in the middle, you get a nice line. There we go. So that's happy with that. That's in the middle. Um, there we go, that's better. I'm gonna start pasting loads of text, too much text for the thing. Now this is where it gets fun, guys. So see that little red like plus symbol? If I click on that and I just drag it and make a new text block, it fills it in for you. But the problem is obviously that isn't the same width as the one I just did. So I'll just go up here, I'll type 75, enter, and there we go. I'll put this back on again. Um, I removed my grid, silly boy, but that's okay. I can just do it this way. It won't be perfect, but maybe I wanna make the gaps um, equidistant. Obviously if I'm a rule as well, it's a bit more accurate, but yeah, there you go. So let's say you're having your essay somewhere in it. Um, that's pretty cool. And obviously, yeah, another cool thing is that those um, text frames are connected. 
So if I just hit enter, see it's moving the text down. And then I could put like essay, essay. Maybe I'd make that more of a more of this sort of thing there. Essay, and it's just whatever it is, or I call it. Um, let's talk about text. Of course, it does that. There we go. And I, you know, I put that there, and that's an essay. But I'm not going to have a, a, like an essay in this little zine. Just if you're doing it, you could do it like that. But again, do consider your font size. And the safest way of doing this is once you've laid out your essay or text or captions, whatever text you're using in your zine or photo book, just print off a copy. Like, it doesn't have to be great paper on a photocopy or whatever, or on a home printer, just print it off and just have a little look, see if that print is legible, see if it's okay that size. But yeah, well, that's it for text for now, but I am in the vortex of trying to think of a font for the cover. So that's where I'm at. So there we go, wish me luck. Doing some fancy work now. So this is photoshopping, one of the f scans I've got. I haven't done anything yet, it's a straight scan. Um, I've made a layer here for a curved layer so I can turn it off and on. You can wow. see it's got a bit brighter. Yep. Wow. But the colours don't look quite right. So I've got my grey point here and I'm trying to click around until it looks right. Now the thing is, is that it was a sunny day. So like, you know, I'm leaning towards something like... I nearly had it. Like something like that. Maybe something like that. Like that. Let's turn it off and on see what it looks like. Does that look good, Tilly? Um, Does that look okay? Um, I like it when it's yellow. You like it when it's yellow? Yeah, I like it when it's yellow too, because it was a sunny day, and the sun is warm, isn't it? So, let's just do some... Anyway. I, I like this. Good. Now look, there's a piece of dust though, isn't there? So what I've got set up is a very ancient little Wacom tablet pen I've plugged in. Let's see that pen, Tilly? That's right. And I'm going to draw on this little tablet with the healing tool. Oh, I'm on the wrong layer. Got to make sure you're on that layer here. I'm just going to drag it over and watch this, Tilly. Watching? Yeah. Watching? Where'd it go? See? And now we're looking for dust. There's someone holding a camera. See them there? Now, is that dust or is that just something in that guy's head? I think it might be dust. There we go. There's definitely a piece of dust there. And I go along, all zoomed in. I've got the navigator window up here, which helps. And to make it easier with this uh, pen, I'm holding space bar and there's a hand tool. Now when I swipe on the tablet, it moves it around. Just like that. And I'll just do that what, for... What, look what this smog is. What? Um, I can't see smog. Smog? There's... I can see there. The smog? Um, that has a smog that is on... A white hair. And that's it. Just got to Photoshop those and, and uh, we'll be done. So finalising the uh, fonts I'm going to use, um, I've ended up sticking with one of the fonts I mentioned previously, which was Phosphate. But you see, if I drop down here, there's two options for it, which is basically two different styles within the same font. So what I've done is I've got the title Bilderberg with the inline version and I've made my name the solid version and this is something that you can do actually in Adobe fonts as well um, Adobe fonts has something called font packs where they kind of group fonts and similar styles together which is quite cool so this top the first pack that's coming up here is called psychic waves and if we look at the fonts in this <clears throat> there's some pretty cool fonts and the idea is is that they're kind of curated together to have a kind of a similar style. So that's something you can experiment with depending on kind of what your you know, photo book uh, or zine is about. Like you maybe try and find a relevant font that fits, but just be assured and sort of check out the fact that you know some fonts are very loaded with meaning. Um, they can be attributed with very specific things. Oh, this is cool. Look at this otherworldly visions one. This is quite good. So yeah, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna activate those fonts as well. So I'm just gonna hit this slider here and that'll immediately make them all work in any Adobe package. So for instance, I'm using Adobe InDesign and immediately they'll be available to use. Now in this video, I really want to talk more about um, text itself. <clears throat> so what do you write? Um, <clears throat> there are no captions in this scene. Um, as it's a zine, it's quite you know disposable and throw away and whatever. I didn't really want to get into it. I just want people to kind of look at the work and have a nice kind of set their own kind of pace and journey through it, looking at the photos to work out what's going on. But at the end, I have written a short essay. 
what I've done <clears throat> as I'm trying to make a whole series of zines is I've kind of created this as a little template. So all the zines that I'm going to make now, they're going to have this similar kind of background, which is I've reduced the opacity of the layer of the background image. So that's now at 69%. I pasted the circle, I filled that with white and I've dropped the text on top. The font size for the text is nine. And I know that's good because I've printed off this uh, cover um, and I've seen it like as a hard copy and I know that it's legible at that size. And one thing to touch on fonts here is I've actually used the same font as I used on the front cover title here, but it's a different font to the body text I've written about. Now, um, the text for this book was a bit, um, a zine was a bit more tricky because it's something that I photographed 10 years ago. But I knew why I went there and I just wrote about why I went there. And basically I went there, I knew it was the Bilderberg and I knew there were the crazy protesters, but yeah, one of the speakers was David Icke and this guy, you know, it was, it's just a crazy story where he was a football presenter and like, you know, sort of a television personality who went on the most sort of important talk show of the time. It was a talk show called Wogan. And he told the presenter that he was the son of God. And he just went, he just went, went off on one. And obviously that, yeah, he, he became like, it was, well, it says here, the Guardian newspaper, Des Christie called it a media crucifixion. It's absolutely wild. So again, just a really interesting character. And obviously there are interesting characters there. But in the second part of the text, what I've tried to do is I've tried to align it to why it's relevant now. Because you'd be like, well, this is 10 years old, this work. So my last paragraph I've written, in the 10 years since, fueled by the rise of social media, populist politics, and a global pandemic, conspiracy theory has gone mainstream. And that's a problem for us all, as without truth, democracy dies. So you see, I've tried to find a way of kind of talking a little bit about what's in the zine, but also kind of my thoughts behind it, and about why it's relevant now. And that's my take on captions. I know other people are more photographic theorists, and they'll have lots of stuff they want to kind of... Um, cover and all that but for me it's just more of a way of just a communicating literally what has happened what i've documented and then also then my kind of personal take uh, into it so there you go um so yeah no captions in the in the scene obviously you can have captions and again my main advice would just be careful how big they are like if you're going to choose a font size you're always best just printing off you know you can just make a, a sheet in indesign or, or a text text block and basically you could just write loads of different sizes of font and just print out an A4 sheet just to sort of see exactly how each one looks. I mean, that's that's not a bad idea and it's much better than paying to print a load of zines and realising the font's so bigger than your zine it makes it like, look like a kid's book. So, again, just yeah, keep that in mind. So there we go. You know, someone said you can't judge a book by its cover, but I really think you can judge a photo book by its cover. Really do. It's a photo book. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, covers. I mean, the best thing you can do is just look at loads of books. Um, some people make the decision, boom, no picture on the cover. So this is uh, Rickard Ostland's book. Look, I'm wearing all the colours. It's got some nice uh, shiny full text here. But yeah, there's no there's no photo on that cover. And that's a call. But then again, you know, The Unseen, one of my previous books from 2016 on infrared, there seems to be no photo on the cover, but if you look closely, it's infrared astrophotography of space. Uh, so there you go. And I think somewhere that was a satellite going by in the long exposure. So there you go, you know. So recently, as in this week, I've had delivery of my new book, One in the Lone Star State. And um, for that, like the previous book in the Garden of England, I chose to have a tipped in photograph. You see it's slightly debossed there and a photo sticker placed on and some gold foil text. And if I just spin this around like the previous book. Oh, look at that. Would you look at that? Isn't that nice? Let's just, oh yeah, let's just get that. Just so. There we go. So again, excuse the scuff here. This is a, just a copy I keep around, but there you go. So this lines up all nicely. There's the one, there's the two. So again, you think about text that you're putting on the spine as well. One thing to think about that. Um, you obviously, you've got to make the text make sure it actually fits the width of your spine. If you're printing a PR bound or um, perfect bound book online, that's a thing to watch out for. Obviously, years and years ago, when I first started getting into this, look, I made that mistake. So, yeah, trust me, it's uh, it's very easy to, to make mistakes, but you learn from them. So, moving on to what I'm doing now is the zine. 
So as I'm like, I'm making a whole series of books here. Obviously, that's the first one in a garden England. Then one in the Lone Star State is the second one. I'm doing a whole series of zines as well. So taking some inspiration from some people who kind of make series of zines, I've decided to do it this way. So my number of my edition is in the corner. Now, this is a very small little maquette, and I'll explain this now. This is the actual size of the zine, but I don't want to waste a load of paper. So I've just printed out the cover. This is a little maquette just to flick through. And this was to, you know, get an idea of the sequencing and how it would feel turning from page to page. This is super, super tiny. But yeah, that's just something that you can do and flick through on any kind of printer at home. And it still works at that size, you know, and even the text is still legible. So that's pretty cool. But um, I want to make it bigger. So I've got big hands. That's about the size of my hand. Um, that's how I'm using the font on the cover. The image is full bleed. And again, when printing, you've got to watch out to stretch the image slightly outside to the bleed. Uh, we'll cover that in a bit on InDesign, another video. And at the back, again, I wanted to make this whole series of zines kind of work together as a set. So all of my back covers are going to look like this. It's going to be a circle of white with a photograph from the zine with its opacity dragged down a little bit. Text, a list of what edition it is, the copies, link to my website and the title of the zine. And that is it. That's what I'm going to do. So there we go. Covers. Um, so for me, because both my hardback books and my zines are part of a series, I'm going to try and keep a consistency in the design. That's the plan. OK, so this is it. This is the, uh, the test print zines from Mixam. Well first impression pretty sexy also I only paid for one so uh not quite quite sure what game they're playing but I like it wow okay look at this feels nice gonna have to check the specs for it you know what mate this looks pretty good this looks pretty damn good Doesn't it? Oh dear me. Well, you know, I was going to pay to print another demo example, whatever, mock up with uh, XYZ, but they wanted 50 quid to print one with them. And these guys, it was 24 quid to print one test print. And also, they're a lot more reasonable. Um, they're about £100 cheaper than XYZ. Oh, I don't know. It's a tough call. It's a tough call. What do I do? Do I spend another 50 quid? Because the other thing is, if I print with XYZ, man, it's going to be about 100, maybe 150 quid more per zine. And if I'm planning to print, like, you know, lots of zines of my work, let's say I print 10. Um, well, that's going to be like 1500 quid over the whole the whole run. Oh, tricky. Yeah, it looks good, doesn't it? <sighs> tough decisions, decisions. Man, you know what? That's nice. That's nice. One of the things you're going to have to do is convert your file types from the usual RGB, which is how you're kind of normally viewing them, into CMYK. And yeah, every printer is going to have maybe a different um, sort of profile. So look, this is Mixam. They're in the UK. They're super reasonable. And I just thought it's worth having a go of them. You know, I'm going to pay to print one of my zines and yeah it's going to cost a lot just to print one copy it'll cost 24 pounds but if that works out well hell i'll print all of them with them and i'll save a fair bit of money so for them this is this is where it's, this is a headache okay so you need to download the profile here which if i just drag it over can you see me hovering this around that's the icc profile that's the color profile now to find it on a new mac is a bit tricky I've downloaded it. You can see this library here, but to find the library, check this out for, for crazy. So if you hover over Go and Finder, you can't see library there, wait. But wait for it. Watch what happens when I press Alt. There it is. Look, now you, now you don't see it. Now you see it. Now you don't see it. There, there you go. So now look at this mess. So I go into Color Sync. I go into Profiles. I'm going to drag and drop that into there. These are other profiles I've downloaded for other printers. And hopefully, now I'm in Photoshop, I'm going to go edit, uh, convert to profile, and somewhere here will be that one, if I can remember where I put it, there it is, that's it. Now, 
you've got some choices here about how you um how you convert it relative colorimetric i normally do absolute colorimetric it's tough man um i'm gonna say that's quite good let's just have a look here relative colorimetric saturation always was a bit of perceptual it's all for this one it's all much of a muchness hmm because I'm printing digitally as well, I might not, um, I might not make it look too punchy because digital printing can have it looking a little bit too punchy. So what have I done so far? This is on the Mixam website. How to convert conversions option. A is your conversion engine. Relative color metric. Choose this preserves all usable RGB colors. So yeah, it will sort of make crazy. So yeah, relative color metric. So done. Click OK. Bob's your uncle, Banny is your aunt, and we've done it. Now I'm going to save this as a different um, thing, but just to not overwrite the original RGB, because obviously if I'm printing photographic prints, I'll be printing RGB for those. But for this, we're printing your photobook zine, CMYK all the way, and you should be okay, all right? Okay, guys, so um, this video is going to be about paper, because obviously you're printing a book, you're going to be using paper. And uh, that seems like a really simple thing. It can get really, really difficult sometimes to then pin down your choice of uh, what paper stock and what GSM, uh, rather what thickness the paper is going to be. OK, so starting off with digital printing. So I'm printing my zine digitally. Um, it's different to the offset process. Um, printing digitally, I can just easily pay to print 50, 100 copies and the economies of scale as in printing loads of copies doesn't really help to reduce the cost or overall price. So yeah, printing 50 to 100 is fine. When you're printing offset, you're going to need to print a lot more. It's a lot more to sort of set up the press and print one. So usually printing a lot more books, like 500, 1000, 1500, whatever, more and more. So there we go. So but digital, here we go. So I remember printing digitally like in 2012 and not thinking it, like the overall effect was that great. But in 2014, I had an exhibition, 2015, I had an exhibition at Four Corners of my infrared work. And I printed this with a company called XYZ. And it was an uncoated paper, um, perfect bound. And you know what, man? I was pretty, pretty impressed by it. It's quite a good finish. So for this one, I thought I'd give Mixam a go. Now, I've known of Mixam for a few years. I know a lot of people use them for printing their zines. And I had them send me a bunch of paper samples and these little fun things. Now, obviously, I've misplaced the paper stocks for printing digitally. This is their LIFO paper or, or rather offset paper. And you can see there's lots of different um, numbers here. So silk paper, at 400 GSM or uncoated paper, at 150 GSM. And basically, the, the lower the number, the thinner the paper. So for most say zines what you might do is you might have your say the the body text of the book at 120 and maybe a slightly thicker cover now for this little dummy one that i printed the paper is 150 gsm and the reason i did that was i know of like a kind of heavyweight paper it seems to take the ink better it just seems to look better at least from my experience printing and yeah pretty cool and for the cover i think i, I should have maybe <laughs> tried to remember i think it might be 300 gsm and it just feels uh, maybe a little bit too thick. Maybe because of that, it's not quite laying as flat as I'd like. So what I did was I took the spare zine that I had and I pulled out uh, a, a spread there, which is 4PP. And now the book's slightly thinner. And I just thought, is that going to make any difference? You know what? <laughs> I don't think it is. So maybe what I'll do is before I print the final run, I'll just reduce the cover a little bit, make it a little bit thinner. And I think that might help overall. But anyway, printing. So... I'm going to print with Mixam. Um, I know I said in a previous video I was going to do two test prints with XYZ and Mixam. And with Mixam, it was £24 to print one copy. They ended up sending me three anyway, which is cool. And I'm pretty happy with the results, man. It looks pretty good to me. Um, XYZ wanted £50 to print one copy. And you know what, man? Like, I don't live the life where I can be like, yeah, 50 quid, whatever. I can't, I can't do that. And I think if the results from uh, Mixam would have been like really not to my not to a standard, well, they are they're great. So you know what, man, I'm, I'm gonna stay with Mixam. And overall, the cost was gonna be a hundred pounds cheaper printing my hundred zines with Mixam, which is pretty good. With Mixam, it's gonna be around two hundred and twenty. I think my quote from XYZ was like three hundred and forty. So again, on price as well, they've kind of gotten pipped. So yeah, you know what, I'll be going with Mixam for these uh, series of zines. So there we go. So yes, uncoated paper. And I just think that also when I, when I printed digitally before, 
And not that neither of these, funny enough, are on digital. This is on Kodak Aerochrome. So this was color infrared film scanned. And this is on, um, I think it was Kodak. Yeah, so this is on Kodak Portra, um, again, scanned. But anyway, generally when I print digitally, I just find uncoated. I seem to prefer it. It just seems to be better. It seems to kind of absorb the ink. It, it takes some of the kind of higher contrast off it. It looks kind of nice. So there you go, digitally. Now, formally printing mother books, I printed them offset, um, which means you have like huge machines to set up, giant plates to set up. You're printing bigger runs. But I mean, the quality is absolutely amazing. And yeah, so for this book, like in a guard of England, I went with a silk paper. And the reason I want this silk was I just like the way the photos seem to sort of kind of almost float on the page a bit. And you can do this with kind of varnishing and pay extra money to do it. But I just find with just a silk paper, it's nice. You see where the white of the paper of the book is? It doesn't quite catch the light. It's kind of a nice effect. Um, GSM wise, I think it's 150 GSM. Obviously, it's a hardback cover. Um, but yeah, really happy with the results. And unlike previous books I've made, it's just one paper stock throughout. I didn't mess around with different paper stocks for the essays or anything like that. I really feel, you know, for this whole series of books I'm doing with Inner Guard of England, which is here, and uh, Texas Hill Country, I'm just keeping it very much kind of the coffee table book. So it's kind of nice. Now, previously, though, previously, I've done the book with lots of different paper stocks, and that was The Unseen, and that was designed by Tun van der Heiden. And it's kind of predominantly uncoated paper throughout most of the book. But if you look here, you can see where some transparencies when you want one. There we go. That's a nice one. So there are transparency papers as well. So my first chapter is about ghosts in the haunted village of Pluckley in Kent. And then this photo is from my Vane series. And you can see, you can just see the text kind of through it. So throughout the book, there's a nice device there. And then there's one final different paper stock. And that is, where is it? Oh, yeah, this is nice. So this is infrared uh, sort of organs. So that's infrared and that's digital. It's nice to have that overlay. But where is it? Um, can't find it now. Here we go. So this. So this whole um, section is shot inside a, an ice cave in um, Iceland. And yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, you can see it's got a nice glossy finish, so it really sets it apart from the rest of the book. So again, if you're thinking about paper stocks, you can also play around with the design. I mean, that's pretty elaborate using kind of all those different paper stocks for like kind of the, that kind of reason. Whereas if you look at this book by uh, photographer Janios of Stock about cool tan in Congo, which obviously is, is a huge thing uh, in the press at the moment, the way, you know, our smartphones are filled with these sort of precious metals and sort of Africa is just getting kind of plundered for all of them. Well, anyway. Uh, I don't even know when this was. Um, a long time ago, Yoffi shot this book, shot this work. I'm guessing like two, th could it have been 2000? Yeah, 2011. So 12 years ago, he was doing it. Now, on a design level, it's designed by Tun van der Heiden, the same guy who designed my book, The Unseen and Atlas of Infrared Plates. It's got kind of this nice open spine here. But if you look at the paper stock for the essays, it's a very, very thin, small, like GSM paper. It's quite nice. It feels a bit like newsprint. But the minute you get to the photos, it's um, silk paper and it's really nice for the photos. It has this really nice kind of finish, particularly for the black and white. I feel like if the black and white had been on uncoated paper, it would have just uh, absorbed a lot of the oomph. Whereas, um, yeah, it works really well. And it's quite a nice design feat. Obviously, Tun's a great designer, sort of planning and plotting to have different sections of text in your book with different paper stocks. You've got to make sure it works. Um, but yeah, fantastic. So yeah, so there you go. So even if you're just making a book and it's more kind of photojournalistic, you can still employ techniques of using different paper stocks together. Phew, it's been a long day. I hope that helped you a little bit. Um, but yeah, so the best thing you can do really is just, you know, look at books, uh, try and find out what paper is on. I remember I, I was going into a deep dive when I was trying to make an agar to England and I started being like, hey, you know, is there some way of finding out like historically what all these great photo books were printed on, you know? And then uh, I think it was a guy from Blue Coat Press. He was like, well, Ed, you know, the printing presses have changed so much. That would be completely redundant. Like the printers from printing William Eggleston's Guide in the 80s are now completely different to what we use. It wouldn't be at all the same thing. So, yeah. So I guess the best thing you can do is like kind of look at paper stocks and just think about what your book needs. Like for me, like my archive of books I'm going through, I don't really want to play those games. You know, I want to kind of let the work speak for itself. And then at other points, you maybe want to think about you know, using paper stocks for certain reasons. Um, but yeah, for me, it was just trying to get a really nice finish. So for my coffee table jazz, really nice silk paper. I think it works really well. With my zines, damn it, you know, I'm going uncoated. And I think that's the, the right call. 
So there you go. Okay, so, you know, when I printed my books offset before with Copper and Lithuania, um, and they cost, so one cost like, what, six and a half grand, the other cost like eight grand, like I went over to oversee the printing. Um, my zines, I'm not going to do that. Okay, I don't think Mixam would let you do that. And if you look at my screen now, you can see I've got Mixam open. If you do live quotes, you click on a thing. And I just want to say also, right, Mixam ain't paying me nothing. Like, I'm not doing this. Um, I'm not being paid. This ain't hashtag gif. I do that crap. I did that kind of stuff. This is just legit me finding like a way of doing it. And the reason I'm doing this is because people I feel in the past made it really difficult to help photographers to self-publish. And they would charge lots of money for this kind of stuff. I'm doing it to help you. And, and I think by extension, helping my former self in a past life. <laughs> so here we go. So anyway, here's what I picked for my zine. Uh, another thing to point out, right? Um, you're printing with offset. Uh, lithographically whatever it's a huge amount to set up making all the plates massive heidelberg machines blah 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 um it would cost loads to print just 50 um zines or books whatever doing it that way so you end up printing like 500 000, 1500 printing digitally is different ball game the economies of scale don't really apply that much so look you know what even though my edition's 100 i'm not going to pay to print 100 i am a fallible human mortal and for me, just paying 100 and whatever quid, 118 quid with delivery, that's enough money, man. Okay, so I'm just going to print 50 first of all. Uh, 50 magazines, 32 pages, it's a custom size, 190 by 230 mil portrait, and 150 GSM encoded paper, digitally printed in colour throughout, saddle stitched, with a cover of 250 GSM. Oh, uh-oh, I've made a mistake, it's silk paper. I need to go and change that. You know why I need to go and change that? Um... I might just click start new quote. So hey guys, I didn't plan to do this, but here we go, we're going in again. 50 copies, colour printing, portrait, uh, custom size 190 by 230, uncoated. When I get to the bit about the cover, I'll tell you why that was important. There's only 32 pages inside with a 4pp cover that's uncoated. Now, originally I did plan on pill printing like a silk or a coated cover, but I decided not to in the end. And we'll, that will reveal itself in time. Hey, what's going on website? Awaiting custom, oh, custom size entry. Oops, I didn't click apply. There we go. Done, 115 quid, you're on. Um, delivered, wow, in like nine days. That's pretty good for that quick. So I'll go add to cart, off we go. That's more like it, uncoated, uncoated. Um, and the reason is basically I'm printing on the inside cover of the zine. And if I had silk paper for the cover, the photo is going to look pretty weird, half on silk and half on uncoated. Not quite sure why I'm getting spinning wheel of doom here. Okay, just clicking it. There we go. Cool. Pending order artwork. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of a cool proofing thing they've got where you can upload your PDF and it will drop it all in for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload file. There's my final PDF. You know it's final because you've written final. Um, that's a joke for anyone who works in this kind of stuff because you end up like final, new final, final three, final, final. So there you go, final. Uh, it's uploading it now. Um, it's a bit like watching paint dry. Um, I could tell, tell you a dirty joke or limerick. Um, I could tell you that my cat has placed his paw on my arm right now. And although my hand's resting on the mouse, oh no, he's taken it off now, I said that. How typical of a cat. Um, it's uploading. Now, before it does drop in, one thing I've done is there's like a bleed box and a trim box. And when I printed the test scene, on the edge of one of the photos was a dude's face. And it was kind of half chopped off. And I liked the way he was kind of peering into the edge of the photo. So I've done something a little bit uh, naughty. I sl slided it over a little bit. So it's not completely filling the bleed box anymore. I don't know if that's going to be a problem. I'm probably going to email Mixam when I go to print. Be like, is that okay? It's slightly in the trim and bleed box. You will see. But anyway, everything else is pretty cool. I've checked it out. But I'll just show you what happens when it fires up. Here we go. There we go. Boof. Magic. Can take up to 15 minutes. So anyway, how are you doing? How's your day? Tell me about you. Really? Oh, it's amazing. And for how long? That's that, you know, you should probably get that checked out, actually, if that's been going on that long. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know why it's been so slow. I, I actually just did a, a run through of this before, and it's actually a lot quicker. Um, yeah, I don't know, I could pause it, couldn't I, somehow? 
Oh no, there we go, bam. So here we go. Front cover, outer back cover, inside front cover. You see what I mean about, you know, if that was the front cover was printed on like a silk paper, then that would have been half silk and that would have been uncoated, but no, it's all uncoated. So here I'll show you now. So where's a full bleed one? This, this is full bleed. So if I click here for the preview, the green is your trim box. That's where they're going to cut it to. Um, and again, I'm not, this is a tricky one, right? Because I kind of like that guy's hands kind of clapping. Um, well, obviously I lost that in the last one as well. Um, and we've got a bleed box here, which you're supposed to kind of fill up, I guess. But anyway, I will chat. I'll send a little email to Mick Sam because look, man, where is it? In this photo, that's it. Um, let's just go a bit bigger. You see this guy's face here. I kind of liked it because obviously if I hadn't slid it over, it's kind of chopping it half for his face. So I wasn't such a fan of that. But yeah, so basically what you're supposed to be doing is going through and checking all your, your bleeds and whatnot. Um, that it's okay and yeah it looks pretty cool to me man um i'm not gonna send this and pay for this now <laughs> i'm gonna do just a final check and i probably will email them about the um the bleed in the previous photo not quite filling up the bleed box um but then also it's it's saturday night at eight o'clock and they're not going to be working because they're not like me or like you we're a different breed of maniac who just is doing this all the time, aren't we? So there you go. Um, that's it. Uh, that's just what I wanted to say about using Mixam. Now, what I'm going to do is actually, I did film when I was printing, printing in copper, when I was printing offset, and I'll try and edit a little video to kind of show you kind of what to expect and go to print somewhere printing offset and those big machines and all the kind of jazz that you have to do kind of on location when it comes to kind of proofing the pages as they come off, because that's right. When you're printing offset, they'll be running these sheets off and it's up to you to okay them, which can be terrifying if you've never done it before. But I've, I've done it twice. I mean, I've done it three times, but I've done it twice on my own, on my Todd self-publishing. So yeah, I'll be able to give you some tips on that as well. But um, both are cool, man. Uh, printing digitally for your zine, cool. Printing offset for a nice big book, also cool. Both is cool. And again, you can do it. You will do it. Good luck. So in this video, I'm going to cover kind of making wet proofs for printing, if you're printing lithographically like offset, but also making a little proof how I printed out one copy of my zine for the digital printing, but essentially also how you're exporting your finals to print both if you're printing offset, like I did for In the Garden of England and One in the Lone Star State, or if you're printing for digital printing, which is how I'm gonna print my series of zines. So what you're looking at right here is what's called a wet proof. And this is the exact same size of the sheet of paper that go through the machines when you're printing offset. It's a pretty damn big sheet. Can't remember the top of my head how big it is. If I was a, a smarter man, if we know a clever way of just like highlighting all this, would it tell me? Oh yeah, here we go. Oh God, oh, oh. I'm so glad I'm recording this. <laughs> Where is it? What is this? The kingdom of Christ compels you. There we go. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, there we go. So that's size 880 by 600 mil. So it's pretty big. Um, and what you're looking at here are strips from half the photos in my book in the Garda England, because when I had it printed, it was printed double-sided. So the other side was the other photos from the book. The photos are sized the exact size they were printed in the book. So you can see the longest dimension there is 240 mil. And what I've done is created test strips, which is the same as if you're printing, say, in a dark room. Uh, you print in a dark room, you do small strips testing for like, say, in colour, for like the colour cast, but also for the contrast, not the contrast, well, I'm just, it's been a long day, guys. It's been a long day, <laughs> but the exposure, that's right. So if it's underexposed, overexposed, blah, blah, blah. Now, in a previous video, I said about how I converted all my TIFFs from RGB to CMYK. If you missed that bit, go back, check one of the other videos. And I've dragged those um, CMYK uh, photos in to make all these strips. Now, this is the important part. You've got to export it to a PDF. So if I go File, I've already set up one here for CMYK Copper, which I've saved. I'm just going to overwrite, I'll write Test. Now, here's the fun part. Everyone you print with is going to have a different kind of setup for what they want in this PDF. So for CMYK, uh, for Copper, it was this one, PDFX 2010. That was right. General, just left all as is. Compression, again, important. Just leave it all as is, maximum, blah, 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 blah. Marks and bleeds. Now for copper, just crop marks, document bleed settings, offset, da da da. da. Output, again, for copper, it's different. Convert to destination and working. 
CMYK PSO converted V3. And that's why I had a set one exported last time. That's standard, that's standard, that's standard. And you just hit export and it'll chunter away and it'll spit out a PDF. And that final PDF is what you'll send to your printers when they're printing the wet proof. And obviously it's really important that you keep those settings the same when ultimately you're going to print your book. So this is my last book uh, published last a few weeks ago called One in the Lone Star State. This was printed offset. And the idea was that, um, yeah, same again when it came to export, I did the same thing. Um, all the photos dropped in are CMYK converted TIFFs. Originally they were RGB, so that's how they were when I scanned them all in. And yeah, there you go. Um, obviously when you're exporting, you've got to be really careful because like I had crazy stuff where I had photos I dropped in and it was stretched a little bit bigger than my little kind of guideline here, the little pink, little pink purple square I've got. And I just didn't notice. I was just sort of breezing through it and checking it all out. So it's always worth kind of checking and checking and checking and going through and double checking. Um, the colors don't look quite great on the screen, but if I go view over print view, that kind of makes it more how it should look. It's just you have over print view normally turned off. It makes it easier to, for your computer to process all that information, especially using all these kind of high res TIFFs. So you go, that's exporting for if I was printing with copper. And I said, I've got my, my little copper one set up here. All the information obviously is on their website. For Mixam, um, Mixam have a different setup for exporting. And what you do is you export your PDF, but then you drop it in onto their kind of back end of their website when it sort of strips out your PDF to fill in the pages. And that's quite clever for proofing because you can see what's going on. And I've got to say one thing I messed up, none of my photos in my previous books in the Garda de England or one in the Lone Star State were full bleed. And if I put press W, look, I've got my bleed line set up here, which I think might be like two mil or three mil. And the idea is if I'm doing an image full bleed, which means all the way to the edge of the frame, got to make sure that it overlaps. Because, yeah, if you don't, there might be a bit of white at the border and blah, blah, blah. And the other thing, um, and again, I didn't actually get on this, man. I couldn't work it out. But I was doing a full bleed to the edge for, say, a vertical photograph. So let's say I had it like this. And let's just do that. I had it like that, but it was printing on to the other side of the page. And I couldn't work out why. So, yeah, sometimes you can see that blue box around my image is a bit bigger than it should be. So you can go fitting and then fit. Uh, fit framed content. There we go. It's a bit better. And if I slide it over now, um, actually, it's because it's not the exact ratio for that photo. But look, what I can do is I click and I do this here and I hold shift. There we go. So if you look now, it's slightly gone around the edge, but it's there. But anyway, my problem was is that I was trying to print full bleed like that, and it was ending up on the other page. So you know what, guys? If you know how to not do that, tell me. <laughs> like send me a message, okay? Because it would really help. Um, as I said, all this stuff, you know, I've printed a few books. It's just my experience of doing this stuff. I am not a professional photo book designer. I'm not a graphic designer. I'm a photographer guy who's just learned that if he has to get stuff done, it looks like generally he's got to do it himself. OK, so that's where, where I'm at now. OK, exporting with Mixam, slightly different setup. Adobe PDF presents Mixam export. Uh, I just write test here. Don't override it. Bam. Now. That's all the same. Compressions the same, maximum, automatic, Jacob. Compressions and bleed now. Mix Sam, they wanted bleed marks on and they wanted to use document bleed settings. I think that was right. Uh, output, again, remember for Mix Sam, no color conversion and don't include color files. So that's what they wanted for that one for whatever reason. There we go. But everything else was the same. And you hit export, you end up with your PDF and you upload that to um, their website. I won't bother getting into showing you that right now. It's pretty self-explanatory. You drop it in, it strips out your front cover, your back cover and all your spreads. What it does is it shows you a nice little proof where you're seeing the kind of um, the bleeds of how the, the photos are kind of looking if they are, if the bleeds are correct, that kind of jazz. And and you know what, man, I did bolt it up the first time I uploaded and I sent a message being like, is it OK? And immediately they got back being, no, it's not right. There's a few errors, blah, blah, blah. So they were super helpful. So that was really cool. Right. Well, that was a whirlwind of six minutes, 58 seconds. Um, yeah, I hope it helps. Most people you're going to print with, whether you're printing digitally or offset, I have lots of guidance on their um, website. And for me personally, my God, with Copper, I must have shot the woman at Copper like a million freaking emails before I printed my first book. And you know what, guys? It was freaking terrifying. All right. Um, I'd never printed a book like Offset before on my own, like self-published. It cost a lot of money. There are a lot of people expecting the book and I didn't know how well it was going to come out. And I was very lucky. The book came out and it's freaking awesome. The print quality was great, the colour cast, whatever, just perfect. Everything was just absolutely perfect. So 
So there you go. So at some point you've got to be bold, you've got to be brave, um, but you can do it. Okay, so yeah, good luck. So here I am. I'm in Lithuania, I'm in copper, and I'm printing my book, which is called When in the Lone Star State. And this little guy, that's right, because I printed that here too. So here we go. So in the background, you can see the, that's the Heidelberg. There's the guy, he's loading in one of the plates, or is he taking a plate out? Either way, um, that's the guy printing my book. Now, um, this is how it comes off. All the sort of lots of pages together on one large sheet and then they're chopped down and that's how your book's made. And obviously he's checking it for quality with the wet proof that we printed previously. And um, yeah, all good, going really well. Looks absolutely amazing. But uh, one of the sheets, some of the photos are coming off a little bit dark. Um, and the thing is, once you're in this printing process, you can't change individual images. It'd have to make a complete new plate to print from. Funnily enough, all the dark photos, a lot of the night ones, were on the same side. And he was able to reduce the black by 10% and boom, check it out. We've got, um, got this nice sunset visible now, a bit more detail here. Um, this little guy, he was kind of lost in the, the darkness, but now look, you can see him there, it's quite nice. So yeah, so far, so good.